Hello once again, AP Calc AB students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School. We are right in the middle of our topic 1.5. It's all about using limits in an algebraic property sort of fashion where we're given graphs. And from those graphs of functions, we're deducing various complicated limits. And it's definitely, definitely challenging. And I've got a, a pair of problems here that I would classify as trickier sums of limits. So fist bump, let's get started with those. So we take a look at the problem, and the example says that we want to consider the graphs of the functions f of x and g of x that are given below. Find each of the following limits. Well, if you joined us for a previous video, you may have remembered that whenever you're finding the limit of a sum of functions, that you can divide these functions apart at the plus sign. In other words, we're just going to separate them. And by and large, this is going to get the, the ball rolling in terms of finding the limit, but it may not cure all of our issues. And you'll see why. Because in the case of this problem, if we find the limit of f of x as x approaches negative 1, immediately we come to the realization that that limit doesn't exist. And we can't take a does not exist answer and expect to add it to something else and get some kind of outcome. Nor can you just assume that the final answer doesn't exist. Because for this particular problem, I can tell you that this limit does exist. Now, it doesn't matter that at g of x, when x approaches negative 1, you also have something that isn't existent. All it takes is for one of those limits to not exist, and then you have to go into plan B. And plan B is to take a look at these two limits from the left side. And while you're at it, we're going to also take a look at those two limits from the right side. Now, I do require my students to write these statements out. It might seem like a lot of work to you, but you know what else is a lot of work? Not testing out a college calculus and having to take uh, 150 some odd hours of a course between studying and class and tests and spending the money. So you know what? I think it would be worth it to write a few steps here so that we might be able to avoid taking that class. So if we're going to find the limit of f of x as x approaches negative 1 from the left, we're thinking about moving this direction, and we slowly get close to the y value of negative 1. And if we do the same thing for the graph of g of x, as we get closer to the negative 1, we find that we get a y value of negative 2. And of course, those are both existent. We add them together, and we get negative 3. So we do the same thing with the right-hand side limits. We're going to approach negative 1 on the f graph, this time from the right side, and we get a negative 2 answer. Remember, it doesn't matter if this is an open circle or a closed circle for the purpose of the limit. For g of x, as we approach negative 1 from the right side, we get closer and closer to a y value of negative 1. And lo and behold, if we add those together, we get negative 3. If you remember from a previous discussion that we had, if the two one-sided limits agree, that means the double-sided limit, which was our original problem, has an answer. And that answer would be the limit upon which both of those agreed. And so the answer to part A is negative 3. Again, not super simple. The fact that you've got to divide this into two one-sided limits is the key. Whether your teacher is going to require that you write that out, you can find out from them, but that's got to be your approach. All right, let's take a look at part B here. In part B, we see that we're going to find another sum of two functions. This time we've got the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x plus the limit of, oh, x approaches 1 of g of x plus 1. So what we've got now is a more complicated function. And so I'm going to give you guys a couple of options here. First of all, one, 
wants to hope that you'd recognize this as a translation or shift, and I'll say a shift, to the left. In other words, the graph of G would shift left one unit. That's what happens whenever you have the quantity X plus one within your function. So it would be very possible that you could take this graph and shift it all to the left one. Well, this graph isn't all that complicated, and I suppose we could either draw it on top, or I have a, a separate little graph over here that I could use. And if all of these points were just moved over to the left one unit, then it looks like we would have something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, oops, let's do this right. That would be at 3. And this x-intercept is going to happen here down at 2. And so I'll just try to connect those as best I can. And boom. Okay, well, that's great. You could very easily go about finding the limit of that new graph, which is now called g of x plus 1, by finding out what x is going to be as x approaches 1. And as it turns out, as x approaches 1, oh, goodness gracious, we have this break here. We have that jump in the graph. Well, I want to tell you something. If you didn't want to change your graph and you wanted to still rely on the graph of g, you could have done that. The only difference is that instead of shifting the graph, you're going to think about shifting the target of x. And so what do you think you would do? Where would you shift that x? x would approach what in order to give you the same picture as that's happening here as x approaches 1? And that answer is 2. So in other words, we could think about this as still being the limit of the original graph that's given, g of x, and therefore we would never really need to look at this sketch at all as long as we applied the operation plus one to the target of your x. And so this would be an x plus two, or x approaches two, I should say. And so in a, in a nutshell, all you'd have to do is take whatever operation you have here, in this case a plus one, apply it, to that number, and that's going to be your new target for x that will allow you to use the original g of x. Yep, if it's a minus 5 right here, you would subtract 5. So in this case, x would approach negative 4. That is going to help a little bit because you don't want to bog yourself down trying to sketch a horizontal translation of the graph. All right, so obviously we've already determined that we have a discontinuity. In fact, f is going to be quite continuous. Well, not so much continuous, but at least the limit exists at 1. But for g of x here, the limit does not exist at 2. So you slip into plan b. If you remember, plan b was to take a one-sided approach to these limits. So there I go for the first one. We'll set it up again here for the second one. Approach f of x. Uh, let x approach 1 from the right of f of x. Let x approach 2 from the right of our g of x, and let's see what we've got here. For the function f of x, as x approaches 1 from the left, I'm going to get a y value of 2. For g of x, as x approaches 2 from the left, I'm going to get a y value of 2, and therefore the result is 4. Now let's see what our right-hand side limits give us. For f of x, as x approaches 1 from the right, I'm going to get a y value of 2. And for g of x, as x approaches 2 from the right, I am going to get a y value up here at 3, I believe. That's going to be a value of 3. And 2 plus 3 is equal to 5, which is a problem. Because the two one-sided limits here do not agree with each other, therefore, the dual-sided limit will not exist. And so there you go. A couple of problems, both sums of functions, 
both containing one or more functions within it whose limit doesn't exist, but yet the final outcome is very different for each one. And the key, and I'll say it over and over again, is to use the idea of the one-sided limit. I hope this helps. We have one more video that covers topic 1.5 that's going to address some of the more trickier composite functions. So be sure to stick around for the video for example 4. In the meantime, keep studying your calculus and we'll see you next time.